World Pride and Stonewall 50 are upon us, but instead of discussing the West Village and Christopher Street, let's take a look across the East River at Brooklyn and that borough's Gay Pass. Gay Pass, you might ask? Well, believe it or not, yes. And it goes to generations before the gay rights movement ever exploded. A new book titled When Brooklyn Was Queer is a groundbreaking exploration of Brooklyn's LGBT history from the 1850s and Walt Whitman to the lesbians who labored at the Navy Yard during World War II. When Brooklyn Was Queer explores these almost forgotten stories and so very much more. Its author, you Ryan, is here with us now to talk about that. You, it's so nice to have you here. Yeah, thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Oh, well, we're delighted to talk with you about this. It's a fascinating book. <laughs> but I was fascinated by how, how you came to this, how you said, okay, maybe I've got to look hard at this, and maybe there's a book about this. It's actually kind of funny. I had lived in Brooklyn for probably 13, 14 years at the point that I started doing the research for this book. And one day I, I realized that I knew nothing about the gay history of Brooklyn. I knew about Chelsea, I knew about Harlem, I knew about Greenwich Village and the Lower East Side, all this stuff about Manhattan. And so I actually went to the library thinking, well, someone's written a book, I just haven't read it, you know? And then there wasn't anything. And there was no website and there was no documentary. And I thought, is there no history? Or is because it that's a, your first inclination. You would think there's nothing there. I guess there, there's nothing there. Absolutely. That queer people are like vampires. They can't cross moving water. They're stuck <laughs> in Manhattan. And then I was like, well, you know, I'm a journalist. I'm already interviewing people all the time. Why don't I just start asking and see what I can find? And slowly, these pieces started to come together. And after a couple of years, I was like, no, there's a whole history here that needs to be told. Early on, in an introduction page, you've got a quote from Walt Whitman. Mm. And, and it reads, there will be a time here in Brooklyn and all over America when nothing will be of more interest than authentic reminiscences of the past. Mm. Tell me how that works for this book. It's kind of the perfect quote for me because I think for a long time, not only have people not sort of looked for queer history or not shared it once they've found it, but they also haven't looked for Brooklyn's history, right? We never talk, well, now we talk, but when I was growing up, you never talked about Brooklyn as a place that people went to or had a history. It was always someplace people came from, right? And I thought, wow, Whitman's really right about this. There is going to be a time, and I think that time is right now, when people are gonna say, no, Brooklyn was and is the second city of the empire, and it has its own history that is, of course, intimately connected with all four of the other boroughs, but is its own thing. And so when I came across that quote in Whitman's journals, because he's such the focus of the start of my book, to hear him say that, it almost felt like he was reaching out through time and telling me, write this book. <laughs> I've got a line for you. Put this in your book. Yeah. Here. <laughs> talk about what you found, because it's interesting you talk about it, sort of peaks and valleys, mm -hmm. if you will, of, of the queer community in Brooklyn. Well, the big thing that I found is that historically, when you go back, you can follow the queer community through following the growth of Brooklyn as a city, right? My book is as much about Brooklyn as it yeah. is about the queer people because it's the economics that enabled queer lives, right? So the oldest queer history we have is on the waterfront because the waterfront is where Brooklyn became a city. And it's also where there was all this cultural intermingling, right? You have ships from all around the world. You have people coming to meet sailors and see entertainments and you have entertainers traveling the country. And all of that intermingles right along the waterfront in Red Hook and in Brooklyn Heights and Vinegar Hill and Coney Island. And so once I'd established that it was this economic trend to follow, it started to be easy to say to myself, well, are there particular jobs and where are those jobs? And then can I find people in those jobs? So everything from sailors, right? Tons of sailors at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Um, even if you go back historically, I found these great stories of a, a trans guy, a trans man in the early 1900s who works as a sailor in Brooklyn and gets arrested for wearing men's clothing and smoking. Uh, and I was like, this is so exciting. But then there are all these other jobs too, sex workers, everything from people who work as street prostitutes to burlesque dancers. I found queer burlesque dancers on Coney Island in the 1950s fighting Robert Moses for sort of the soul of the city. And these stories were just so exciting and undertold. Why do you think that they were first undertold? And, and secondly, why you talk about a kind of a transition mm -hmm. of Brooklyn itself? I think they were undertold for a lot of reasons, right? When you go back historically, a lot of people destroyed their own records, or they didn't tell people, or their descendants destroyed their records for them. One of the people I profile in there is Hart Crane, the poet, and his mother, after his death, actually destroyed all of these letters he had between other men. Another person that I focus on is Florence Hines, who was a black drag king who was active in the 19th century, 
and she was the most popular female performer of color of her day and the highest paid. And yet the newspapers didn't follow her because she was black and she was a woman and she was masculine presenting. And so you can't find a lot of stories. I spent years looking and found one image of her, even though she was so popular. So there's the sort of records that don't exist in the time period or get destroyed. And then you have this kind of really downturn in queer life post-World War II. The why, why did that happen? A lot of things. Well, one, in Brooklyn, you have the economy, right? The waterfront is no longer as important a destination. The St. Louis Seaway opens up, and that changes everything. And you get the suburbanization of the city, that stagflation and white flight. And that rips apart a lot of communities. And at the same time, you suddenly have people realizing that there is such a thing as homosexuality and heterosexuality and journalists and courts and even the army telling people homosexuality is bad and you have to police yourself at all times. After World War II, the army starts giving these induction lectures where they explain to people what homosexuality is, how to find it in others, and how to find out if you yourself might have homosexual tendencies. And so they taught people that you had to avoid these things and you had to suppress them. And so all of that happens post-World War II. And so what had been destroyed in its own time period then gets suppressed in the next time period. And now we're sort of in this third moment where Brooklyn is queer again and people are interested in pulling this history out and discussing these histories and the new communities that are in Brooklyn because there are so many now. Last question for you. There's so much we can talk about, but I want people to go read this, <laughs> which we would like to do. But what if someone says to you, hey, I saw you wrote a new book, um, and their, their question is essentially, what am I going to take away from this? What would your answer be? I think the biggest answer would be that historically, throughout every time period we can look at, every place, there are people with queer desires, sexual, gendered, and that those people form lives. And those lives might not actually look a lot like ours today, you know, and that's the important part, that we've got to go look at what they actually did, how they experienced and talk about themselves. I came to this book from a place of ignorance. I didn't know anything about this history, but it was there. And I think for a lot of us, we think, well, I don't know anything about a queer history where I'm from, so maybe it doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. And what I want to tell people is to go out and to work in your community and to look for those stories yourself. I worked really closely with the Brooklyn Historical Society. They're incredible. They have an exhibit up based on what we found. But your local historical society has things too. And to go and look and to share and to work with them. Well, it is a, a wonderful and, and compelling look at time and place. I should say place and times <laughs> of that place. And I, I think it's it's just a fascinating journey you take us on. So you thanks so much. Again, the, the book is When Brooklyn Was Queer, and we appreciate your spending some time with us. Thank you very much. You take care. You too.